So I think the way Russ and I are going to do this, we're going to tag team this section, and um, we have 20 slides or so, 20 or 22 slides, something like that. And um, we're going to go through those, and um, then we're just going to have Q&A. So, and if there's something in one of those slides that you want us to stop on and ask about, I think that's fine. So feel free to stop us along the way. And this is, um, this is uh, you know, non-scientific um, musings of writing grants for years, sitting on study sections, getting rejections, once in a while getting lucky enough to get one funded, and a number of the things we'll talk about probably apply to any grant that you might try to get funded, but we have particularly uh, slanted this toward, obviously, the topic for this meeting, DNI grants. And I'll just say before Russ dives in, um, in addition to those of you that are online looking at the slides, which we'll make available to you, you might want to look at, I'm trying to find, page 41 uh, is a nice synopsis of a paper by uh, one of Ross's colleagues about, uh, I don't know, it was something like uh, 10 key ingredients for getting, writing, and implementation research grant. Yeah. So you might want to make any notes or questions you have on that uh, as well yeah. as, as our slides. Yeah, and if we don't cover something on that list that you want to know about, then because we didn't really link our slides up to that list completely, these are kind of our musings, which I think is going to layer in quite a bit with what Enola came up with. Okay, so let's see. Nothing working here, Borsha. You want me to do the slides for you? I guess. Maybe. All right. I don't know why it's still working. Okay. So, have you ever seen this cartoon before? This black box cartoon? So, this applies to many, many different things in life. But in this case, the left side is you're doing this grant, you've got this great idea that could change the world. And on the right side, you got a score back, and it said you're going to get funded or you're not going to get funded. And there is a bit of a mystery in that middle part about what happens. And so, what this is trying to do is help us to figure out when that miracle of funding happens, why, why it might have happened. Vanna, okay. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, so, so a couple of years ago, um, the, when they, so a while back they changed the scoring system in NIH, and, and basically it went to this one to nine scoring where one is perfect and nine is horrible, and you know, you're in between, and they tried to spread it out and make this better. And so that one to nine ends up being your impact score, which basically is whether you're going to get funded or not. And so what they did after the first 32,000 grants had been, gone, had, had been reviewed, they went back and they did a regression analysis about which of these five subdomains, so these are the different subdomains where you're getting scored in your application, which of these subdomains are really predicting whether you're getting funded or not. And so what does this tell you where you want to put your emphasis? It's on the approach. And so the approach gets weighted almost sevenfold, significance three, then innovation, investigator, and environment, a little bit of a negative cor correlation. So a little, little strange there. But, but it does tell you, and I think this is what we would think if, if you sat through study sections, you get a bunch of researchers looking at methods, and what do they think they're going to sift apart? You know, think about it. All the areas you work in are likely to be significant, or you wouldn't be doing them. And you're going to probably have really good teams. Innovation's tricky. We'll talk about that a little. But, but approach is kind of what to focus on. So the key take-home message there is if you're writing like an increasing number of applications that are 12 pages or 6 pages long, and you have to cut something, what's the last thing you cut? Methods. Okay, methods are the last thing that you cut. Because okay, that's of, what I always say, not described enough. Yeah, and it's, it's often kind of the last thing you write because the front sections, and so we often see like the significance being really long, and that's, that's usually a mistake. And so, good point. And so, the first thing people see is going to, well, not the, the abstract, but, but the first kind of part of the application people see will be your AIMS page. And the, the AIMS page is, is, you know, the front part of it is kind of, briefly walk them through the issue, why you're addressing this issue, the design you're using, and then the most important part, your overall goal and the aims. And there's different ways to set this up. 
Keep the, you know, this is that old saying about you have one chance to make a first impression, and this is, this is sort of your first impression for your grant. Um, keep them realistic and, and don't use too many. I don't know about Russ, but if anything, when I see a grant, it's often, I barely see a grant with too few aims. So it's usually the other side where someone's writing, you know, a, a developmental grant and they have five aims or, a, or, a, or an R01 grant and they have eight aims. And so, you know, you could often nest them together, but I try to get them to maybe three or four aims at the most. Um, and this is, you, you're, and the aims are where you're going to kind of walk them through and kind of measure through the whole application. Okay, so uh, other key point there is the word in italics, realistic. I think besides some kind of fatal methods flaw, the, one of the most common reasons that something isn't funded is considered overly ambitious. It's not realistic. Just given the team, given the money, given the experience they've had, it's just your, what you're proposing, just that you, don't, you haven't sold it, that, they're, that it's going to be feasible. And I've, and I've gotten to one other little thing that I learned actually from a cell biologist I, I was reading grants one day, and they, they organized differently. When I get to aim one, I'll give like a, a little rationale statement. Then I'll give the aim, and I'll say to accomplish this aim, we have two activities. And so, and they're almost kind of bulleted little things. So each aim has its little section of its own. It's almost a little mini proposal of each aim. And, and, and look at other people's proposals you've seen, others you've written with, and sort of sift out the best ideas that you think make sense for yours. So in terms of... Uh um, uh, I've heard, I think it's 100 something like that. <laughs> <laughs> or is it just completely Well, so that means for an R01, you're going to have five, I guess. So I, I guess, you know, I guess that's a rough rule of thumb. And I, I think, you know, I don't usually write an R01 with more than four. Um, just but, because I think, if you think about the approach, you know, you're limited in the pages now. And explaining how you'll address five aims is can be a lot, but but it may depend. Another question? Yeah. Just in terms of you have specific aims and hypotheses, how important do you think it is to actually have a hypothesis? You know, I think it depends. Um, like everything else. That's the answer to everything. Yeah, everything <laughs> it depends. Um, I think if you have some directionality, you can explain, and you have some hypotheses based on previous work, then it might make sense. If you're writing the first of its kind R21 measurement grant where there basically is no literature, then I would not try to do... Would you write it as a research question or would you just stick to writing any? I do sometimes use research questions. And a lot of it, you know, unfortunately I think a lot of it ends up being what space I have left because you can write up a whole series of research questions. I sometimes will do sample research questions or example research questions. If you're comfortable with hypotheses, I've only seen that backfire once, and that's when they get carried away and they have like 300 hypotheses. Yeah. But, but I don't think I've ever seen anybody get beat up or penalized for having a, it just takes a little more space. But sometimes it really helps clarify and get the reader you know, there too. But I think it's maybe more of a, a style thing or a disciplinary yeah. thing, some disciplines. But generally you're not going to get in trouble, it's just you give up a little space, just like most things, as long as you don't get carried away with it. Yeah, usually. And I think, too, sometimes you might have a primary aim, and so you might want to put a little more meat on the bones for that one, and you might have secondary aims that you don't have as much around hypotheses. It, but, but again, it has to be specific. You can get in trouble if it's not specific, and that's why hypotheses can help you. So, for example, you could either have a hypothesis that my innovative intervention is going to be better than this comparison condition hypothesis, or you can just say, I'm going to compare these two specific interventions on this outcome where kind of the hypothesis is, is implied that yeah, way. But, but you need to be specific. Or you could just take that comparison and turn it into a question. Yeah. You know, does this condition do better than that condition? And I, I actually end up doing that more often just because in a lot of these areas I don't, I don't really know what the hypothesis would be because I, I don't know the directionality of something up front. And then, and then we're going to start with the approach even though that's not sequentially what you'd see next. And this is, the, this is the heart of it. This is most likely what's going to really drive your score overall. Um, and the design, I mean, this fits very well with what Borstika covered earlier. You know, match the design to the research question and then to the measures um, in the application. Make sure you 
attend to internal validity, which is what we often do well, and then make sure that you address external validity as well, which is, which is even more important in a DNI application. And here's a little, a little bit more on, on external validity. Um, often important, often missing in the literature. Um, there's good resources, actually Russ and, and Larry Green, West Coast Larry Green have written <laughs> quite a bit about well that have you know nice checklists for external validity. And so while you don't have to go through all what 24 items there, you might use those domains to say we're addressing these four main domains around external validity, and, and if you need any of those articles, if you don't have them, um, easily we can get those for you. Um, and they, these are a few just examples of, of some of the external validity sorts of data that you might want to collect. Um, and that can also just be participation. If you think of sort of an ecologic framework, who's participating, this can layer well with a re-aim kind of a framework as well. I think this general contextual notion of who, what, that says there is, is uh, an important uh, issue. And I think the first panel did a great job today, if you remember back to it, about talking about this, just the questions that even though they didn't use these words, I, I keep thinking particularly David uh, Goff was saying he'd always ask himself, well, can they do this in other places? Can they do this in other uh, primary care settings? Or is this so unique to mine? Um, I will tell you one thing, uh, just a uh, quick uh, self-referent. When I was at Kaiser, I often got beat up on proposals because they'd say, you're doing it, oh, well, you can do it in Kaiser, but that won't generalize anywhere else. So again, you need to think through issues like that, and will this work, or how broad of other places would this be able to work in? What kind of resources would other places need to, to adopt this? And this could link toward the front end of your application, there's a literature now called the scaling up of interventions or the scaling up of practices. And so if you think about that scaling up as the ultimate goal, we found something that worked in one setting, now we're going to scale it up over a whole state or a whole country. This is where that external validity sort of connects to that idea of scaling up. Questions? Why yeah. How do you know the measures should be at this point? So providing a few examples how we will measure a concept, is it sufficient? And then how do you deal with the idea of participatory research when you don't exactly know what the intervention will look like or the measures because the participants will inform you? Yeah. It, you know, it, it depends, depending on the topic. I told you. I mean, how many times will say that? So this is like a drinking contest. <laughs> See how many times it's like Sarah Palin winking. Her the day. Um, um, <laughs> it's late. Um, so, so for example, if it's a measures development grant, an R21 sort of grant, then measures being developed is that's what you're doing, and so that's part of that grant. If it's um, an R01 grant, and the rest of your grant really depends on having reliable and valid measures then you probably need to show some of that pilot work up front or at least some indication that now now I have had you know bigger grants where there was still a measurement development phase at the front but we had a pretty good idea of what we were doing going in so it, I think it sort of matters what the stage of the of the uh, of the research is it's a tricky one it really does depend like I think if you're going to PCORI versus NIH what you generally don't want to go is in something for your primary dependent variable where you're not sure you don't want to go and say well I know it could be this or it could be this that's that's usually the kiss of death so for that but some of the other things like your measures of context I think my experience if you give them concrete examples and you'll say we'll work on this we'll refine it but here's an example as of today so you kind of want to show your work, even if it's not all the way, you know, worked, worked out. Yeah. Okay. And then the framework thing I think we've covered pretty well. Have a framework. That's the way to start. Link it all the way through. And we sort of said this this morning, I think. Um, and, you know, the TABIC thing isn't the only way to go, but it's a, it's a, good, it's a decent starting point. Um, I was talking to the group over lunch a little bit about, you know, I think the biggest limitation in this article is we did not try to go a lot into other literature outside of health. And, yeah. and if you're working in policy or working in quality improvement or other areas, 
the business literature might give really valuable guidance or the like we're using one grant where we're using um, some some theories institutional theory which came out of economics and business and so sometimes if you want to and, and this is where the Tabak article we did a little of that but we did not do any kind of systematic look at at non-health literature we'll get to innovation later often if you can apply some theory from another field and say this is the first time to our knowledge is being applied on this health medical topic public health topic often that will score you good innovation points so that's the only part of this I would link and then making sure that the I think Russ already said this this morning that it's not just a framework you dropped in never to be seen again that, that it's linked all the way all the way through the proposals from the aims to the activities and the measures and the and the analyses and that's probably one of the most important take-home messages in this whole slide set we have for you is yeah. that one again they're looking for consistency so it makes a coherent picture and what you said about the significance you'll see that show up somewhere in the measures uh, it's you know it's in the aims and then the analysis there's analysis that addresses it and then more on the approach you know who are you where are you working do you have access to those settings how are you recruiting participants in the study those this could be you know practitioners they can be actual um, actual community members if you're if you're doing a study like that how are you going to sample um, why did you choose these settings in the first place have you worked with these settings before so your experience showing the access um, this is where you know letters of support you know working in schools for example schools are tough to work in so do you have a track record doing that can you get sample letters from a bunch of schools um, if you do get letters showing you have access don't use one form letter that everybody just signs the same letter and puts it on their letterhead <laughs> what I do with the letters I I get everybody on my team and say you're writing two letters you're writing two letters and so we all write them a little bit differently and then we provide them to the to, to our stakeholders and so they look different because you know you can tell really quickly if it's one form letter that everyone's like that's still better than no letter at all but but you want it to look you know like someone took some attention to this um, and then this this sort of get you know getting at this participatory thing which I don't think I really answered very well before how are you engaging partners how are you using that as to inform your studies again the external validity comes in again and then um, the pilot data depending on the reviewers in the study section might not call it pilot data but but you know the feasibility that you can do this is is probably very important in the bigger grants the R01 grants and the you know the multi-million dollar or the 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 multi hundreds of thousands of dollars a year grants yeah. I think the things on this page are really maybe kind of unique to DNI most everything else we talked about probably applies to most other things but this notion of the setting and having thought through that and the partnership issues and that sort of thing are really uh, kind of critical somewhat not that they're not relevant to others but there's a much greater emphasis on it and particularly the engagement thing if you're doing a PCORI grant and, and that, that engagement often, especially for PCORI, needs to be multi-level. Needs to be, think about the re-aim example we just did. It needs to be with the system, with the provider team, and with the patients. Okay, not, not just, just one of them. And I would think about, you know, engagement can take a lot of different frames. So do you just have some advisors who represent your stakeholder groups? Do you engage them all the way along? Are they paid part of your teams? Um, when I work with practitioner groups on any grant that I can possibly afford it, I pay people, I give subcontracts, I make it look like it isn't just all the money showing up at the university and we're asking other people to volunteer their time. So, so think about that and, and, and some of your groups will, will basically not play ball unless you do that, but we should think of it first and not, not say, oh, by the way, did you think about maybe you should give a subcontract by organization? And these bigger grants you could do that and it, it does show a more, you know, there, there's there's always in these participatory projects this balance of power and the truth is whoever's getting the money has most of the power but you need to do whatever you can to, to equalize the the power relationships that that exist so that it truly is a partnership and then we have measures and we're, we're talking a fair about about measures in this project uh, project and um, you know think about the the variables you're trying to measure um, the importance of those so if it's your primary aim 
then all these issues around feasibility, reliability, and validity are probably more important. Um, the, you know, are we asking people to fill out 300 item questionnaires? Or are they things that are kind of user friendly and, and practical for people to fill out? And are you providing sample measurement tools in the appendix? And are they realistic? Um, and then the issues of adaptation of the measures. Most of the projects I work on, there aren't you know, ready off the shelf measures, but there are measures you can start with. So you're, you're often adapting those and, and working those through. Since I don't have anything uh, intelligent to say about this, I'll just tell you what the little thing in the bottom right is, in case you're wondering. Uh, this is adapted from a presentation Ross actually did at another uh, DNI training program that some of you might want to think about if you get in this area. It's sponsored by the VA and the NIH together uh, once a year in the summer, assuming the government isn't shut down, but it's an intensive immersion, uh, week-long training uh, experience, and it's a, it's a pretty good deal. Uh, actually, uh, you get everything provided, and maybe or maybe not travel, but all your room and lodging and all the materials and access to generally world-class faculty almost on a 24-hour basis. Yeah. And then the analytic methods, again, linking those all the way through. If you're doing a quantitative project, make sure you have some kind of a, a power calculation to justify your sample size. And even though in qualitative work, you're not doing a sample size of power calculation in the same way, still so show a rationale for why you're reaching people. And maybe the sample size calculation is, we're going to start with 10 people and we're going to keep going till we reach saturation, or something else that a qualitative researcher can help you work through and, and understand and make sense. And, and for those of us who were really never trained in qualitative methods, this is where it really pays off to partner up with someone who has that expertise um, so that you so that you get it right because there are often you know in a proposal that has three or four reviewers there will be one of those reviewers who really knows qualitative methods and you want to make sure you don't say something that doesn't make any sense and then this mixed method part is important and and not just that you did both things but how the data fit together and how they can be integrated or how one builds on the next one and, and really think about it deeper than just you know, we've got some quantitative data here, we've got qualitative data here, but they don't really connect up very well. I'll just add one thing that isn't on this slide is that in general, this is really a, uh, a transdisciplinary game and multiple disciplines. And so usually, and most people probably wouldn't think about going in for a large grant without a statistician of some type playing along. But similarly, if you're going to do a cost analysis, you probably do want to have if not a full-blown health economist, at least as a consultant or yeah. an actuary or, or something like that. Or, but in general, what you want to do is demonstrate that someone on your team has the requisite expertise for the different areas that you're, uh, that you're getting into. That's a good point. And then this one can be important, especially in a, this is maybe another one, like Russ said, that is especially important in a DNI grant. So this is kind of that management and dissemination plan. Not dissemination research, but we're gonna, here's how we're going to manage our project. Here's what we're going to do with our results. I often talk about a translation and dissemination phase, where translation is we're thinking about these stakeholders. Here's how we might reach you know, health department people. Here's how we might reach policymakers. We're usually really good at reaching other academic people. That's usually one you don't have to worry too much about. But the other audiences, thinking about those and thinking about how you're going to reach out to them, what messages might look like, and then how you'll reach them. And this is a part that, you know, it's not a separately scored part of the application. Actually, it is in some, some CDC grants and some of the R25 training grants. This, this section is actually a separately scored component. But in a DNI grant, the study section tends to look more closely at this. And this is one place where sustainability might fit in. It can fit other places as well. But this is this notion that, OK, what's next with what I'm doing? And what are some ideas about how it might be sustained? Not that you have to fund that or you can project out 15 years from now, but some ideas about that. And there, some agencies put a lot of stock in that part of it as well. Anything else? And okay. then we're going to uh, trade over. I'm going to do first, and then Ross will uh, add the points or correct me, which uh, I'm just kind of an interloper. These are actually his slides, so I'll probably get half of them wrong. 
Now we're going to go back to the first part, the significance, after your aims, your significance, your background, your, your context, selling them on the importance of, of what you're doing here. So the scope, and I think Ross makes an important point here in the, in the second point, uh, it's one thing to do attributable risk, like for example, you saw today, well diabetes, this many million people have it, it's this big of a problem, but also what's your likelihood you can do something about it? It's one thing to say it's a big, and that's the idea of the preventive fraction based upon what we know about the evidence that people stop smoking, it might actually do, do, do this much uh, good. Uh, the notion that Ross talked about, about scale up again, if we were able to do this nationally, what we're studying in this, you know, we're doing a modest sized project, but if this were to be scaled nationally, this is what it could mean, you know, for the country or for uh, health care or whatever. Um, in my experience, the uh, third bullet point about review of the literature is where people get really hung up. You want to show you know the key studies, the classic studies, and probably recent studies, but I've seen so many people either waste six months trying to think they know every study that's been done, then they throw their hands up if a new one's been published or something. You don't have the space for that. That's not what this is. This is not an exhaustive, systematic review. Okay, it's showing that you know the key literature in the field with emphasis on the, on the key uh, there. And, and then focus on the gap. And so what you're selling is not only it's important here, but it's the gap between what's known. So I've just reviewed, I said it's important, okay? I've said here's the literature that exists, here's what isn't known, and then that leads into your study. Yeah, yeah I think that in the third one, what I often start with, and it depends somewhat on the content area where you work, but think of a review of reviews so that instead of going to the 100, 150 original research articles and reviewing those, start with systematic reviews or narrative reviews and review those on that third bullet. And then if there's still some gaps, you can go back to the original literature. But in most of our fields, there are reviews already out there. And so summarize the reviews and that often keep, help, lets us sort of keep it brief because this is where you, and, and this is where if, if you start off and it, and it looks too long, go back and cut this part. Um, I, I would say on almost every grant, this is where I end up cutting, cutting text out is in the, in the significance section. Yep. Again, if it's a forced choice between methods and significance, you want to cut significance. So uh, let me read the bottom here. Uh, the notion is defining what evidence base means. So it is a drinking game, Ross. Yes, we have I knew there was in there what it, uh, what it says at the bottom is, then we're agreed that all the evidence isn't in and that even if all the evidence were in, it still wouldn't be definitive. So more research is needed, right? That's what's just kind of, I don't know. Do you have anything else to add well, to that? Well, okay. this is just, if you, if you, so if you look under the NIH DNI program announcement, this notion of evidence-based is all over it. And so what does that mean exactly? Does that mean there have been five systematic reviews done on it? Does it mean there's one or two good randomized trials? And there isn't, there isn't a magic definitive answer there. Um, I think, you know, set at least sort of a middle evidence bar and say, well, at least there's a few credible reviews, or at least there's a good body of literature, or maybe my parent agency, the, you know, the, the parent body for HIV AIDS prevention has designated this as an evidence-based practice, or something where some expert body has said this is evidence-based, and, and for at least the NIH version of DNI, that will help. Often uh, other things that will help a little bit is something like when a key prestigious group like the Community Guide Preventive Services Task Force comes out with a recommendation. And sometimes these aren't always evidence-based. As Linda knows, for example, in cancer survivorship, the IOM has come out with some things. Usually that's enough to carry the day, yeah. even though not all of those recommendations may be, may be evidence-based. But there's some other authority beside you that, that's kind of saying that, you know, we have a sufficient body of evidence. But again, the true answer is, is it depends. And as Ross says, this is something that the field is, is working out. And is it, is it this exact intervention with this exact population? Or is it this principle? Or is this, this, this notion of diabetes prevention program? Is that it? Or is it your particular thing? We, we don't know. And you kind of have to make your case uh, to the study section. So innovation. Uh, this is kind of a tough one because it's a double-edged one because of what Ross just said. 
On the one hand, for a DNI grant, they want this to be evidence-based, so it has to be. So it's kind of hard to be truly innovative if it's already, you know, somebody already had to do it. So how am I? But but there's some twist on that and ways to think about uh, making a DNI grant innovative, even though it generally has to be evidence-based. Uh, one way is the study population. So. Uh, I think one of you had a good example today that the DPPs worked in general, but has it really worked in, you know, uh, well, Spiros thing in uh, Native American populations? Or one of you, I think, ha is doing that in Latino populations. So taking something else, and particularly with, if you will, an underserved or more challenged population. Um, a second one is how you're going to adapt this. Okay, cultural adaptation, making it uh, culturally appropriate and, and, uh, and sensitive. Um, you can apply a new framework or approach, a new theory, uh, or, or not necessarily a new theory, but one of these theories that hasn't been used before. Like maybe um, Ross is a closet system science here. He's coming out a little more each year. year. Uh, but like applying complexity theory, uh, I think colleagues did the primary care a few years ago. It had been used in physics and basic science before. People hadn't used it to you know primary care and think about what are the implications uh, there. Anything else to add, Russ? No, and I said about the non-health theory before yeah. as well. And there may be other things you could think of. These are just some examples. And you know what. Russ thinks is innovative, maybe right. different than mine. So what I usually do is line out like maybe four or five reasons. First, it's innovative because of that, and maybe the reviewer is going to buy two of them. But you know, <laughs> maybe they're not going to buy all of them. But but you know, kind of lay it out. And I've I've read some grants where the innovation is all kind of mangled together, and you don't exactly know what they're saying. But I say it's innovative first because of this, next because of this, next because of this, and and lay it out as clearly as you can, and then. Let your team look at it and, and you know see if it passes the laugh test with your team. <laughs> I'm curious about the non-health theory, especially say for NIH grants. Have you gotten positive reception for something so far outside of health? <laughs> I have had good luck with that, yeah. and I and I know others who have had you know large grants funded by doing that. Um, I suppose there's a risk at everything, but and, and don't do something that doesn't fit. But if there's something, like I was looking at this institutional theory, and it had a lot of things in there about how it seems like health departments make their decisions. And so I said, OK, this is, and I sort of molded it with another more commonly used theory, and, and, and you know, the reviewers seem to buy it. So you know, not something that's, that doesn't really fit, but if, you, if you've got someone on your team or you're working, this is, gets to back to the transdisciplinary thing. If you're working with some other disciplines who, who say, you know, we've got something in our field that fits really well if you thought about this. Uh, we used Kingan's policy theory in, in one grant we did, and, and we modified it a little to kind of make it look more public healthy, but, but it, it seemed to work. Yeah, again, you know, the answer is it depends, and, and you have to sell. I mean, it's a sales job you're doing, but uh, uh, in general, like with Ross, as long as they can see the connection, like just a couple other examples Ross mentioned before, organizational theory. I've seen that do pretty well, people that know a different organization or a business theory, how they're applying. I mean, healthcare is a business, you know, to look at that. Um, I think I just lost my uh, other example. Oh, I know. A lot of uh, things that I saw rated high on innovation was applying like systems engineering from the engineering field to the healthcare. I saw that be rated as real, real highly innovative. Again, but we're not saying just do something different just because it's different. You know, it has to make sense and fit yeah, your, fit your problem there. Okay, so for PCORI or community based community engagement uh, projects, the notion is. Think about framing this as stakeholder engagement, and again, I would say generally for DNI, multiple stakeholder uh, engagement. And this is our the D4D is our acronym for designing for dissemination. I hope that's one of the take homes you're getting. If you're not sick of hearing it already or today, you don't wait till the fourth and a half year of your five year grant and then say, well, now I'll think about maybe disseminating the results. You, you should be doing that from the beginning in partnership with your uh, with with your stakeholders and things. Ross, anything else on that? Can I yeah. One more time? Go ahead. Um, this time I know that's a question of so how do you deal with this in the grant? Because if you want to do the two partnership then you are not going to deal with everything. Right? Yes. 
I don't know we have any better answer than we did the last time you asked, Cub Worsica. Let me think if there's a, there's a different one. It's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering, is it enough to say that certain interventions, is it okay to say that certain intervention components will be refined or developed once we hear from the stakeholders, or is that going to be a problem? No, I think it is, and something I do, I'm a little mixed with sharing it, but sometimes I do, and I've, I've gotten stung sometimes, but not always, is to have kind of a, a build-up year. I usually call it a refinement year rather than a pilot year or a working out. But again, the danger you run with that, if you play that up too much about we're going to develop all this, then they can say, well, you know, come back and write a, you know, an R21 or an R34, and then when you're ready for a real play with the big boys, come on back then and see. Yeah. There, so, so it's it's walking a, a fine line. But I think my own gut level is, and again, I don't know. I, I've never reviewed for PCORI. I don't know if Ross has. Maybe I know you have, Borsica and, and others. But I think PCORI may be a little looser on that because of this importance and looking more willing to accept that than would traditional NIH study sections. But you could probably respond to that better than I could, actually. But um, but but it's a it's a fine line. But again, I think the. The issue is giving them, even if it's an example, a specific concrete example so you demonstrate that you're familiar with the issues that you have something in mind. And it's not just, well, we're just going to get together and, you know, we'll make up something, you know, as we go along. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, have a plan. <laughs> That sounds like the drinking party. Even, right? yeah. <laughs> even, even if that's the truth. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> And maybe we'll have a good answer by the time we're done here. We're gonna, we'll try it. <laughs> right, there you go. Third time. Third time's a charm. Maybe you'll get a decent answer. <laughs> okay. Um, often we get asked, because life isn't easy, and often there's an issue about, should I go for a smaller grant like an R21, an R03, an R34, they are different ones, or should I go for the whole banana, a big grant, an R01 or an R34? In general, it's, uh, it's a little easier to get funded, particularly if you're a younger investigator. Uh, maybe the standards aren't quite as high uh, for you to get funded on a, on a smaller grant or if, if there's a question. Um, but, but there's no, again, it's, the answer is it depends. It, it just depends on the status of the field, of the team that you have. If you are a young investigator and you want to go for a large one, it usually pays off to have an experienced investigator as a partner or whatever uh, in that or think about a co-I situation or something. The downside is, in, again, in my experience, the small grants are often exactly the same amount of work, almost identical the amount of work that you have to do for a large grant. So sometimes I say, you know, let's just go for it as well as I'm just impatient. And so I don't want to wait two years to do the small grant and then revise that, you know, and go another year to do that. But, but again, it kind of comes down to often how big a risk taker are you, and there's no right answer uh, to that. You want to say anything about I'll, that before I go to the other the, points? I guess the second and third bullet is almost always when I'm get right helping someone get their first big grant, they almost have the, the team is too big. They're adding all these senior people, yeah. and, and they're never going to be able to get them together for a meeting anyway. And so, so you know, don't don't leave out any key disciplines. But I would say always there if you're thinking about should I add two more people or keep it where it is? It's often keep it where it is, and then usually starting out. More often, people are trying to do too much than too little. So that kind of gets back to the aims we, we talked about. Those two things sort of link together. Yes? I think, like, it depends if you're already at a senior level. They might need to add a much senior or everything. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's true, but although, you know, you may be better off funding more of one or two senior people than five or six small percentages, and yeah. that, I agree, you need to have that, that balance of junior and senior, but what I often see is we have five people with 5% time, and unless they're really key to it, I would say, you know, reduce that down to 
two people with 10 percent time. Yeah. Otherwise, that raises management issues, particularly if they aren't at the same location. But the yeah. other the other issue, just the pragmatic issue, is since they haven't changed the budget caps, you know, what, since 1850 or whatever, you know, on that, and you get a number of senior people, you don't have much money left to do the work, the people that are actually going to do the work. Yeah. So a lot of that's just a, a pragmatic, uh, pragmatic issue there. Another one we probably should have put in italics, use the tables and the figures. That often can convey it really is worth probably at least a thousand words okay of your text they have a good solid figure or a text and those as Ross said the things I would work over and show to different people until I get it right are the tables the figures and the specific games those I would go through multiple times show them to people that don't know what you're doing and see where do they get confused or where are they not able to follow anything else Russ no okay uh, I think good examples, if you can, uh, is to uh, do the, the first two things. I know a number of uh, institutions are trying to do this. Uh, because more people are getting onto this, it used to be kind of novel, or doing either mixed study sections or experience reviewers. Sometimes the, uh, the pay to play comes in, and so now people are sometimes expecting to be paid a little bit if they're, if they're not your colleagues at the same institution for doing this. But, but often it really does help. Partic uh oh, what happened here, Borsica? No video input. Uh oh. Oh, you don't? Okay. Well, thank you. Hey, I pushed the wrong button. Yeah, I got the, the blue screen of death here. So was I done? Uh, no. Uh, study section, okay. Uh, well, you know, we have a few, uh, a few things to make you feel better here. We can empathize and then go drinking together here, so uh, at the end. I think this notion of an experienced reviewer uh, does help because just they can anticipate the types of questions that uh, come up. Uh, and again, uh, we'll come back to this, but the uh, article you have summarized and the points there by NOLA, and we'll kind of check to see if you have any question about that, that's great. The NCI website does have on there uh, both successful grants and characteristics of successful grants, if you look that, and I think that's in your notes. If not, we'll make sure that you get it on the NCI Implementation Science Study section. And maybe most helpful of all, within, I'm going to guess, two months, the folks at university, I've learned being back in Colorado, Ross, it's not just you. I used to say UNC. But UNC, you know what that means. So here, that means Northern Colorado. Yeah, yeah. UNC Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, is putting together what I think is really going to be a state-of-the-art website for DNI and implementation science, and they're going to include a number of full proposals and things. They've asked leading scientists from around the country, and we'll maybe send out something when it's ready. They're kind of piloting it now with showing it to a bunch of people, but you might want to look at that in a, in a couple months. So it'll be a great resource. <laughs> Um, and then the last point is really important. I can't tell you, particularly when I was at NIH, and I used to hear NIH officers before I went over to the dark side say this, this last point, please be a reviewer. And maybe I'm sure Ross wants to address this too, but it, it really is critically important. This is how our field advances. And I can't tell you, you know, how many people like to sit back and fold their arms and, oh, it's a screwed up system and I got ripped off and, you know, it's just the third reviewer, everybody else is fine. It's a, but, but, you know, the two things are, I do think we have an obligation and actually a number of institutes now are starting to take you up on that, particularly if you're funded. It's, it's an expectation to go in there. And also, I'd say particularly, you know, for those of you that, uh, you know, are a little younger than, than Ross and I. I mean, I think that's the way, that's really what Thomas Kuhn said, you know. Science paradigms change when the old guard dies off, you know. It's, uh, it isn't really any big aha that, that people have there. But, but it, it's really important uh, when you, you get these opportunities and things to do that. And it's also valuable for you because you kind of get to see the sausage being made up front. And you'll see some of these issues that Ross and I are trying to tell you secondhand about. So it's, uh, we, we strongly would nominate you and not be bashful about, about volunteering yeah. either. And you can self-nominate. So yeah. there's an early career review at NIH. And then the other, you, so that's formally. And, and I've heard from people sometimes that's kind of a long, a long process before you hear back. You do eventually hear back, but depending on you know what the government's doing at the time. Uh, the other part is if you know someone in your institution who's on study section, oftentimes they're looking for ad hoc reviewers, and 
I've had really good luck just to say, you know, so and so, could you use an extra reviewer? And they they often can't go to that. So a, 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 the SRO, the the review officials who kind of manage the review groups, they often have two or three of these. So they can't populate the same review section with multiple people from the same institution, but they can get other like review panels. And so take advantage that way if you if you want to. And it's a really if you haven't been on a panel before, you really do learn a lot. It's it's a lot of work, but it's worth the work, and it's also, as Russ said, an obligation for us. You know, when people complain, you know, well, that's the other saying is, you know, we bet the enemy, and the enemy's us, because we're the ones who decide what gets reviewed and funded by by these study sections. And so, if if we're upset about you know not not getting enough grants funded, um, then it's it's on us to to make that happen. Yeah. And uh, not to wave the flag too much, but I think uh, having traveled some internationally, and Ross or others may have Borsica more perspective on this than I do, but frankly, you know, it's far from a perfect system, but generally if you look at the way it's done the rest of the world, which is still largely a good old boy system, you know, an insider and who knows who, it's, it's probably better than the alternatives, as, as imperfect as it is, you know. Doesn't mean we don't need to continue to, to work on it. Okay, uh, resources here. You'll have these on your slides. Uh, we could maybe look at Enola's, but I think we've got uh, maybe 15 minutes for your questions or until the, until the group you comes. The oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I got the, uh, the fun stuff. I'm sorry. Okay. So I'll let you do this, Ross, since this well, is so yours. So this is the yeah. fairness. If it doesn't feel fair, it isn't always fair. This is the one about for fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb the tree. <laughs> and so somebody's going to win, and, and maybe that tree is, you know, maybe the experienced investigator is going to win out a little more, but that, that happens. And then I made this next one. Okay, the next one, Russ. I had something to say about that, but you I did? forgot what it is, so I think oh, I'll go ahead. What, uh, what was it? Yeah, well, I don't know if it's a fish out of water or something. I'll think of it later. Let's, let's go ahead. But... And this used to be only the Cardinals, but I, I managed to <laughs> update it. If you're a hockey fan, we got the Miracle on Ice. If you're a gymnastics fan, we got the, the women's gymnastics team. And then if you're a Cardinals fan, I'm probably the only one here. Although Elaine is not here. She's a, oh, you're a fan? All right. So if you remember the 2011 World Series when we were out of it, well, miracles can happen. And that does happen with grants. My example there is I got a, a grant back several years ago that got not discussed the first time through. Wow. And um, we debated, and I actually conferred with Russ and others about, you know, is this worth even reapplying for? This is a lot. You know, writing the, the, the second round is a lot of work because, it, you know, it's basically like writing an article revision, but a lot more work than that. But discussing with them, it seemed like there were, you know, a couple things in there that were fixable, and we, we wrote it, and we resubmitted it, and got almost a perfect score the second time through. And that was my miracle. That was my, my sports metaphor here, is that sometimes you can, you can get it back through the second time through, even though when it looks like it's hopeless the first time through. So, you know, you have to look at that and say, are there fixable things here? But, but sometimes it can be that way. And there's probably well other other miracles you could put up there, but for the sports fans, and those of you who are not sports fans, sorry about that. <laughs> and next time when you come to town, you'll put in the uh, Rockies. Who was it? The Rockies uh, miracle finish a few years ago. Yeah. Just because yeah. the Cardinals are always in the damn thing at the end. I know. You have to, you know. Okay. We'll uh, let's take uh, whatever uh, questions, and comments. Ten minutes. For you questions. have, yeah. Do we wear you out? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, way in the, earlier in the talk, uh, well, you know, this morning, you had mentioned that one thing that often helps certain grants be differentiated from others is that they're not just um, putting something into a new setting and not just implementing it somewhere else, but if there's also some novelty about the, the advance of the science in mm -hmm. some way, or, and mm -hmm. I think. It seems like you're maybe speaking to a methodological advancement or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could you, um, uh, elaborate a little on what you meant by that? Yeah, I mean, it probably depends a bit on the, the field and the stage of the field. But, you know, for example, if there's a, a new method, uh, a statistical method, you know, complex systems modeling that has never, so right now it's been applied in certain fields. 
But if you've searched the literature and it's never been applied in our field, and these systems modeling kinds of studies are definitely can be DNI studies. So that could be an example where we're applying a new method, an old problem, but a new method trying to address that problem. Sometimes it could be a theory, it could be an analytic approach, it could be a new way of, of, of reaching a, a, a high-risk population that hasn't been reached before. I don't know, it could be any of those, I think. Let, let me give you a concrete example that isn't quite on target because it actually was just a uh, internally funded study, but we didn't do for a grant. But in the early days of re-aim, we were trying to push this issue of reach Okay, and particularly who is the representatives of people that are being reached. Um, so one thing we did to try and both show how the model could work but push it a little bit with the methodological innovation is uh, because we were approached by diabetes educators who really uh, their question was they had a, a, a curriculum that they knew worked but nobody was coming. And it was an in-person group meeting, and so what they wanted to do was test out a DVD and look at the pros and cons of that. And the methodologic innovation, so again, re-aim made sense there because it was a reach issue, but the methodologic innovation that we did there was instead of just using a standard RCT, if you think about it, which is, was pretty much at that time almost required mm -hmm. thing, is we used what was called a hybrid preference design, randomized design, because the fundamental question was about reach. Okay, but if you think about uh, a randomized trial, what's the requirement to be in a patient? You have to be willing to accept randomization to anything, yeah. to either of the interventions that's going to be there. So it's kind of a logical impossibility. If you had a strong feeling and you weren't willing to participate in one, you wouldn't participate in the RCT. So we kind of walked through that and showed the limitations. But then we did this hybrid design where half of the people were randomized to choice. Okay, and the other half were the traditional RCT that we did. So it was this mixed design, so we're kind of fitting this theory that's focused on reach, but we had this component where we could look at the choice, and that's really the bottom line that does truly answer the question about reach. What do people prefer and what will they participate in? But then, to satisfy the people, the scientists concerned about internal validity, because there's self-selection issues, if we just let them choose, the other half then were randomized to be in this, this uh, ran, you know, standard Standard randomization condition. So, so yeah. You basically randomized to your choice. Sorry. So that we were taking this really Okay. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you guys did. So you randomized to choice or RCT. So then the individuals that were randomized to the RCT were randomized again to the. Correct. Okay, that's correct. It, you can neat. think of it okay. as a two by two. We analyzed it differently. It was it was either arbitrarily from this whole registry mm -hmm. of people that they were randomized to either have choice, you know, be approached with a choice, which is the way it would work in the real world, by the way, too. Yes. If you're gonna do you say, Hey, you got these couple options, exactly. you can come in person right. or do this. So we argued that had more external validity right. too. Or you could be in the more u traditional mm -hmm. randomized condition. Mm -hmm. And then we also look to see, if you will, if there were any interactions. So it was choice right. or randomization, okay. and then these two, the traditional in-person or the DVD. Okay. And did you find that with the choice that it did improve reach? Interesting. What we found was is the DVD uh, apparently was a good one. On the outcomes that we had, both biologic and kind of self-management, it did as well. And over four times as many people were willing to do the DVD or chose to select that. So huge win on reach, but it was kind of like the member Deb Ritzwaller on the cost. It wasn't so much on the effectiveness measures. They were pretty much equally effective, not much difference there, but here the home run was on the reach. We showed they could get four times as many people yeah. with the same effect. Hi. Uh, so, um, and just regarding my case in specific, I was talking to her. Um, I'm an MD and mm -hmm. I've always done clinical work and now I'm transitioning to research. And uh, so in terms of publications, it's all about like clinical reports and anything, nothing of mm -hmm. much weight. Mm -hmm. So you were talking about the, the investigative factor and mm -hmm. how could I improve my chances given that considering the fact that I, I'm starting, so I'm considered early investigator, like, but it, I'm not that, that yeah. young yet. Yeah. <laughs> I have 10 years of career, uh, career behind sure. me. So how could I improve this view? 
Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I do is I'd ask uh, three different people because they'll have five different answers for the question, <laughs> and, and somewhere there'll be a good one in there. Uh, the most thing, and then uh, see, Ross may have better responses than I do. One is I would maximize what you have, or think about you know making you know, lemonade out of lemons. So what is I think Ross said it earlier, or somebody said. Who are the best implementers, the people that understand? They're the people that have been in practice. It isn't the academics that sit there. It's the people that have real clinics. So I would really play that up and focus on your, uh, you know, your opportunities that way. Second thing is I would look uh, for a really strong team and partnering with an experienced investigator. Uh, third, I would try to have some pilot data that Ross said. I think pilot data is probably even more important if you're a, and it doesn't have to be the world perfect study, but just have some pilot data to uh, go in. Yeah. Ross? And I would only say, you know, sort of in the grant world, start with small grants. Start with, mm -hmm. if there's institutional grants you can apply for, often, are you here, Colorado? Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so you know, often um, institutions, universities have, you know, five to eight thousand dollar pilot grants that are, that are targeted for new faculty and new investigators. Or in the NIH world, the RO3 grant is $50,000 for two years, which, you know, for most grants is pretty decent size when you're starting out. But for NIH, it's the tiny, tiny grant. And so start out with those and then, and then focus on getting, and I think I agree with everything else Russ said, but also focus on some, some data sets and some ideas where you can get some publications out pretty quickly. So the track record you have will be building up in the areas where you want to build your research now. Yeah. I, I just add to that in terms of other grant sources, often foundations, I think, have less of a, you know, whatever, getting late in the day, I'm trying yeah. to think of a politically appropriate word, but uh, get their shorts in a knot less about you have to have 100, 100 yeah. publications before they'll consider, you know, funding you or whatever. Yeah, so. and, the, and the voluntary agencies, you know, Cancer Society, Heart Association, Lung Association, Alzheimer's, you know, you can name off the different groups. Whichever groups might line up with your work, they often have small grant awards and, and sometimes have new investigator things as well. And so somebody has to ask a final question here, break right before Borsica asks us the third time and we still don't have the answer. Yeah, so. we're not giving the mic back to Borsica. <laughs> Um, I have a question about sort of uh, computerized meth like delivery of interventions. Um, so if you have, let's say, a pretty strong evidence base for a, in my uh, field is, um, I'm a clinical psychologist, so a psychotherapy for depression, for example, um, and you're looking at um, trying to increase like access by having a computerized version of it. Um, at what point do you need to sort of start through the pipeline again and show that you know, you haven't changed, like, just your delivery yeah. method or your strategy hasn't changed the intervention so much that you actually have to go back and, like, show effectiveness or efficacy. Yeah. Like, at what point, you know, is... That's a tough one. Um, you want to start that one? <laughs> um, I'll try. I think if I was uh, stuck with that, I would think, one, about going to theory. What's the theory that it's based on? And then I would, like you say, then I'd look at the kind of the evidence-based components that you, that, that you have there. But it, it can be a tough one. Uh, the other thing that I think sometimes can work is if this is a relevant question to you that you're interested in, usually these are done in person to start with, and then there is do a comparative study. So you can actually show, and then sometimes you can get away with that, even though that's kind of the innovation, is the innovative one, but we're showing that it's evidence-based on the principles and the theory, but we're going to look and see. That's part of the test here. So it is an effectiveness yeah. study. Right. The other is, think of this hybrid design for bridging from a, an effectiveness trial to an implementation study, and maybe you're a hybrid one, so you're, you're still going to have a large effectiveness component, but you're thinking about where it's going to go later. And that would be the other thing to add. And we'll send you a reference on these. That's one omission we made on the, the hybrid yeah. uh, hybrid yeah. design studies. They're starting to get yeah. a lot of traction. And Can we do uh, a couple. We had a couple more questions yeah. down here. Can we do a couple last quick questions? This I think will. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we'll be quick. Is just your um, kind of gauging of the funding world. Is it worth going for a DNI grant 
um, in response to an FOA that isn't explicitly DNI these days, or without an example of DNI in their scope. So a funding announcement that's calling for like an effectiveness study, but you're thinking of writing a DNI study, or um, it it could be any number of things. Um, my world is is it's a lot of community based health, so there's mm -hmm. all sorts of things out yeah. there that aren't necessarily effectiveness studies, but yeah. not yeah. explicitly DNI. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you always want to write to what the funders are asking for. So, so you might include a DNI component in a study, but still align it with whatever the main goals of that of that FOA is looking for. And and usually having some DNI component can never hurt it. But if it's if it's not the primary goal of the funder, then I wouldn't align it that way. Yeah, two two answers. I generally agree with that. The the first one, of course, is it depends, uh, which is absolutely not helpful, but it's true. And the second one, and I can't believe we omitted this, Ross, is talk to your program officer yeah, at yeah. the funding agency, whatever institute is. They they are going to be the best one, and call them. They can't always put things in writing and stuff like that, but set up an appointment. In general, what they like because they're really busy too is like a one pager, your specific aims, or at most a two pager summarizing both your issues and then your questions but then uh, please don't be bashful this is their job is to talk you're their constituents and and they're the one that's going to help you answer all these things that we said it depends they're going to know what the review group is they're going to know what was discussed behind the scenes and, and stuff like that so so always talk that's another key thing that uh, you talk yeah. to your program officer and it's even more important now than ever because there are a lot of these grants that end up sort of on the bubble that you know, 10 years ago would have been funded, but now they're kind of in the iffy zone, and that's where the program officer can go to bat for you. But they're unlikely to go to bat for you if they've ever heard from you before until you need a favor. And, and so if they know early enough that, yeah. hey, this is a project I looked at, I remember it, the person's been in touch with me, you can usually tell if they're excited about the idea or not, because a lot of these program officers are very high-level researchers themselves. And so they've got certain things they're interested in. So that, that's one we need to, yeah. to add. Often when we've done these sorts of presentations, one of the presenters is a program officer. So they're, they're saying that, but, but it's, a, it's a really important one. one. More over here was, did you have a question? No question, but it's, it's not directly related to this. It was, went all the way back earlier today and I didn't get to ask it, which is, question of adoption, if you're doing a research study, the people who are willing to participate in both an implementation and research project are probably different than the sites or settings that are willing to just, would have been willing to just do the intervention by itself. And so I often struggle with that because I've certainly had, you know, organizations I want to work with say, well, I would be willing to adopt the implementation, but yeah. I don't want to do the research. And yeah. I'm just sort of wondering what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, I mean, it gets a little bit to this response burden and what you're asking them to do. Um, if you can think of it sort of in between, um, the, the definitely someone who's willing to, to put up with all of our questionnaires and all the times we're going to want to interview them and talk to them, they probably are somewhat different. But if you can demonstrate even how they're different, from those who didn't participate, sort of the non-respondent things. And then as we go through, you know, I had one project where there were these long, long questionnaires on the built environment. Well, our research study was to develop a user-friendly measure of the built environment that any practitioner group would be willing to do. And so sometimes there might be a, and that was the research project. And so sometimes there might be a research goal that could even be looking at reducing the burden. So um, three different uh, answers quickly. First of all, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It isn't the same. Sometimes what we've done is call the research one potential for adoption, and then the other when you don't have the research, the actual adoption or whatever. Secondly, I think as you heard a number of times today, the thing that you can do is think about ways to minimize the burden. And often yeah. that's one way you can be innovative is really minimizing the burden on the settings. A uh, quick example was, uh, that Be Fit, Be Well project we talked about, we didn't go in and say, oh, the primary care doc, we're just, so we're only going to take five more minutes of your time. I mean, they've heard that a hundred times. We said, 
It's not going to take any of your time. It's going to take something else and a, a different staff member. So think about how you can, uh, can, can minimize the burden. And I think with that, I just forgot the only uh, one third other thing answer. I would say is, <laughs> at least when we work with agency people, if, if we promise that we will feed back to them the evaluation results and they can use that in their own quality improvement issues, even though they know it's a research study, they know that's coming later and they know that's going to be a benefit for them and, and it'll often get people involved who necessarily aren't interested in research but they can see a benefit. I mean, because people in this field, they want to do better, they entered the field because they want to make a difference. And so if they can see something that leads to their quality improvement, or potentially does, that, that's that been a really big thing for us in working with a lot of agency people. Yeah. I, I remembered what I was going to say. The other one, it doesn't, it's, it's quasi-related, but that I think has been a game changer for me. So when I approach settings, instead of doing it like I used to do, and I still think the majority of people do, they come in and say, can we just get 50-year patients, you know, to, to be in this study or whatever? Um, often I would approach, and I think it's a better answer, say, we want to work with you to design this so that it will work and be feasible in your study. So I only want you to participate if this is something you'd be interested in doing after the study's over. And again, we'll work with you to try and do that, but really you should only participate if this is something that, that you'd like to you know, continue uh, to do or if this is you know, important enough for you to, to carry on otherwise. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Elaine is going to be back to uh, do a wrap-up of the day. And then those of you who are going to be here tomorrow, I'm sure she's going to give us instructions on the meeting tomorrow. There will be a reception after her wrap-up, so please don't leave if you have some time. I'm sure we're anxious to be finished. It's been a long day, hopefully a good day. Um, and so I just wanted to take five minutes before we have sort of our closed reception, if you want to stay for some personal networking and so forth, just to say, to recap, say thank you. Um, these were, this was our goal for today, was to really start the conversation here around DNI concepts, design strategies, and approaches. Um, to give information that I hope you find relevant and useful as you think about incorporating these um, principles into the work that you're doing, and to really, in the, in the breaks, in the um, lunch periods, et cetera, to f begin to foster that we have a, a learning DNI community here, both on campus, at our local hospitals, at Kaiser, at the VA, and so forth. There's many folks here on campus that are, are in our community that's doing this work. Um, for those that will be here tomorrow, we will be meeting in this same room, and then we will be, you have a packet of the group that you're in, um, and then we'll disperse to the rooms there. But please meet here first, and we'll just kind of go over what the morning will be like. Um, and at 8 o'clock, yes, thank you, um, Borshika, for reminding me. So at 8 o'clock here, um, and we'll I'll kick it off there. Um, but I just wanted to, to come back to what Ali had talked with earlier and really um, give my heartfelt thanks to everyone that's worked on this um, planning committee out of uh, their own um, personal time as well as interest. We couldn't have done it without everyone here, particularly Borshik. I really want to thank you I, in terms of co-facilitating this and, and walking us through. And of course, then the experts, is, as we have noted, those that have come from out of state, so Julie and as well as Ross, um, as well as our local experts who've taken time out of their days to come here and share some of their, their, their learnings and so forth. And also uh, with Russ, who walked us through the re-aim project example um, and so forth. Um, but we do want your feedback. This was a, a one-day session. It's a workshop session. It can hit on some things. It can address all your learning needs. Uh, we understand that. So there will be a survey that is going out. You should expect by email uh, probably early next week. Um, and they will bug you if you don't turn it in. So hopefully you turn it in early and you don't get the repetitive emailing that I often get. Uh, <laughs> I don't fill it out right away. But we want to hear what you thought about today. Um, we want to hear about what might be your own educational needs or interests. Um, we have an ongoing monthly seminar 
um, that we can incorporate some of this learning. Our interest is to put this into an online resource beyond just the slides and the handbook. So if that sounds interesting to you and you'd like it, let us know. If there's other kinds of information you'd rather have, let us know that too, because we will, we will listen um, to what you have. Um, and so we have reception outside for those that still want to stay. Um, we please hope that you join us. And uh, uh, we want to thank all of you for taking your day here and spending it talking about dissemination implementation. So thank you.